Hello and welcome to Global Health TV, our new monthly show exploring the complex issues around improving healthcare worldwide, reducing disparities and protecting against global threats. Today, we'll explore how health inequalities affect access to vaccines with Dr. Sergio Aguirre Gaciola, founding director of the Center for Reducing Health Disparities at UC Davis Health in California. Health disparities are at the heart of uh, not only who is dying uh, by COVID-19, uh, but who is getting the vaccine as well. But first, we're joined by Dr. Alex Eze to discuss why, so far, the impact of COVID has been lower in sub-Saharan Africa than in the Americas, Asia and Europe. While the World Health Organization African region reported more than 5.7 million confirmed cases and over 139,000 deaths as of mid-September 2021, the mortality rate of COVID-19 per million in Africa is considerably lower than in all other regions. Dr. Eze, thank you ever so much for uh, joining us today. We, we really appreciate you taking the time to do so. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for having me. So, so I guess my first question is, why has the impact of uh, COVID been uh, lower in uh, sub-Saharan Africa than in some other parts of the world? been a lot of uh, effort to try to understand why uh, COVID-19 has had relatively less impact in Africa compared to the rest of the world. Population of Africa is relatively much younger compared to other regions of the world. A lot of the people that were affected by COVID-19 uh, in the first wave of it and uh, for a long time were really much older people. If you look at the proportion of people that died from COVID in Europe or North America, as uh, largely in those in their 60s, 70s and 80s and older, the median age for the uh, population in Europe is somewhere around 38. Uh, in Africa, it's about 18. And so people uh, postulated that because of the low uh, young age uh, population in Africa that uh, the impact of COVID has been relatively uh, less. But one of the fundamental issues that come out of that age dynamics for Africa and the rest of the world is really the issue of long-term care facilities. This is a major part of the uh, social system within uh, high-income countries in Europe, in North America, and in other regions of the world, that a lot of very old people, and particularly when they get frail, live in long-term care facilities. In Africa, old people are not uh, staying in such facilities. Long-term uh, care services and facilities are not readily available and many people are cared for in their families, in their villages, in their communities. And that uh, limited the widespread of, of the virus and its implication among other people uh, in Africa as these people were not concentrated in the same uh, space and, and facilities. You were saying earlier about uh, how uh, uh, there was a, a, a lower impact maybe, uh, you know, in Africa than some other parts of the world. But, but unfortunately, we're not through this COVID pandemic yet. So, so what needs to be done now to, uh, to lessen the effects of COVID on, uh, on sub-Saharan Africa? The, the Delta variant should be concerning for many African countries as increasingly uh, we have very young population and if they are susceptible to it, then we don't see any reason why on the basis of that, that Africa would not be affected. So that requires a careful attention and we need to be able to strengthen surveillance systems to document who is getting infected and by with which variant and how is that spreading across uh, different population groups. One of the basic instruments we have in, fight, in the fight against COVID-19 is vaccines. That's been very uh, uh, 
available in many high-income countries and many other parts of the world. If you look at many African countries, more than half of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa are still under 1% coverage of the vaccine. If you look at Nigeria, one, the largest country in Africa is at 0.8% coverage. So we have to do more to reduce the inequity that exists in access to vaccines. How is this going to be done? How are we going to resolve the inequity of vaccine accessibility? I think if we have the will, uh, uh, Stephen, to, to do this, uh, the, we have the means to do that. Uh, I think if you think about what uh, COVAX has been set up to be able to do uh, to support these operations and uh, if, if it can be supported, then definitely we will be able to uh, get these vaccines to countries and reduce the huge impact that's likely to be there when the Delta variant uh, gets to a number of these con uh, of the countries uh, on the continent. So my sense is uh, it's having the political will to do that and look, recognizing that so far a lot of our responses to COVID-19 has been driven by national policies and each country looking after their, themselves and their issues. And, and it is important that you deal and address with local issues. But if this is a global pandemic, it does make sense that we would have a global strategy to dealing with it. And such a global strategy is currently missing simply because everybody is still scrambling uh, to ensure that they are safe. But we cannot be safe if uh, COVID-19 still remains very prevalent, even in one country. With globalization and the opportunities for travel and all of those, it's only a matter of time before uh, we'll begin to see a reemergence of this and, and variants that we are not even uh, accustomed to at this point. Alex, thank you very much indeed for talking us to, to, to us today. It's really fascinating uh, stuff, so, so thank you very much. Now, on September the 9th, 2021, US President Joe Biden announced new vaccination mandates for 100 million workers as he looks to stop a new wave of COVID-19 across the country. We've made vaccinations free, safe and convenient. The vaccine is FDA approval. Over 200 million Americans have gotten at least one shot. We've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin, and your refusal has cost all of us. Prior to President Biden's announcement, I spoke to Dr. Sergio Aguilla Gathiola, founding director of the Center for Reducing Health Disparities at UC Davis Health, to discuss how inequalities affect access to vaccines in the rural communities he works with. Give us a little bit of an insight, if you would, as to how health disparities uh, affect the ability for vulnerable communities to get vaccinated. Very much. Uh, health disparities are at the heart of uh, not only who is dying uh, by COVID-19, but who is getting the vaccine as well. Vulnerable populations that have been particularly hit uh, with excess mortality are unfortunately not the ones that had been getting the vaccines. So there is this gobble, double whammy that is happening to uh, populations uh, such as uh, farm workers, for example, which is a, a group that we are working with throughout the pandemic. They were really, really negatively impacted with excess mortality. And yet uh, they are still, clearly they are not getting uh, vaccinated at the same levels as uh, other groups in the population. So what, what actually needs to be done then to help these groups? Clearly, at this point, uh, we have to go uh, uh, where they are. You know, we really uh, have to make uh, efforts first uh, to identify where those needs are. And we have the means to do that, both in terms of uh, uh, where the clusters are happening still, and also uh, where uh, the vaccination rates are lower, and uh, go and uh, meet with where they are. In the case of farm workers, for example, I can tell you with a high level of precision where the vaccination rates are low. And what we need to do is uh, uh, to, and we are doing it, by the way, is to uh, micro-target 
some specific areas and to do it uh, in, during hours where we know that uh, we can find them and days as well. For example, Sundays are a good day for them. And there is a proportion who is willing to get vaccinated, but they don't have the time to get vaccinated because uh, getting vaccinated in their minds uh, uh, is uh, uh, that they are uh, you know, losing a, a day's wage. And just imagine uh, some populations, vulnerable populations that are living day to day uh, is, a, is a difficult choice. Transportation is an issue as well. And also, uh, you know, we continue, for example, to use testing and now integrating with vaccines. And those who are found positive, which is a lower number these days, uh, we are in the process of providing economic support, food, and housing. They live is of critical importance because that allows them to really uh, take care of themselves and their families. And also the food is to be provided not only to the individuals that we find to be uh, uh, positive, but uh, to the whole family as well. Because clearly it's to the advantage of the whole society to, uh, to look after uh, vulnerable groups because until the, the whole society is, is, is vaccinated, the whole society remains at risk. Absolutely. And, and it's in everybody's best interest uh, from different perspectives, you know, from certainly the public health perspective, uh, it is uh, undeniably of critical importance that we keep all populations safe because COVID-19 doesn't know borders. You know, it, uh, it is so pervasive that we need to, uh, to be thinking collectively. The other reason, reason is economic. You know, uh, the most uh, uh, negatively impacted here in the US, US uh, had been the essential workers, for example, from different sectors uh, like agriculture and food, uh, construction uh, workers, uh, manufacturing workers. And uh, we, we really need to take care of themselves because they are taking care of us. Uh, as simple as that. That's it for Global Health TV for today. Join us again next month for more news and views from the global health community. Until then, goodbye.